Well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Mindy Buchanan. I'm the patient engagement manager with the Foundation for Sarcoidosis. Um, I see you guys are all kind of getting into the room. That's wonderful. Uh, we're going to get started right on time because we like to end right on time. And so I'm going to introduce our panelists today. We have Dr. Edward Miller um, and Dr. Brian Young from Yale. And we have Sammy Sarani, who is a physician assistant and a patient navigator um, with FSR today. Um, we're going to start off today with Dr. Miller. So I will hand it over to you. Okay, great. Um, share my slides. There we go. Uh, so thanks for having us and thank you to Punt, the FSR for putting this together. This is, I think, the third one of these I've done uh, and they're kind of the highlights of, of my year when I do these. They're, they're super fun to interact with all the, uh, the patients and, and talk about people's uh, disease and um, you know how, be how better we can treat it in the future. So um, I'm going to talk about in broad overview what cardiac, cardiac sarcoidosis is and what questions the patient should ask. Um, sort of as background, I'm a cardiologist. I direct the Nuclear Cardiology Laboratory here at Yale, so I have a big interest in PET imaging. I've been uh, treating patients with cardiac sarcoidosis uh, for uh, over 10 years now, in um, both in Boston and, and now at Yale in our infiltrative cardiomyopathy the disease clinic. A couple of disclosures. I have some research funding from industry, none of which is relevant to um, to this particular talk. Um, so when I see patients, and I see a lot of patients with sarcoidosis in, re in referral, uh, I have three major questions that I get from them. Uh, the first is, do I have cardiac sarcoidosis? And that's not as straightforward as one might think. Um, the second that I tend to get is, do I need a defibrillator? Um, and then the third is, uh, do I need to take steroids and or immunosuppression? And so I'm going to talk through these uh, three questions uh, with a broad overview and can add detail uh, folks want uh, in, the, in the chat. If you're interested in the scientific guidelines, the, the expert consensus statements that underlie and uh, that uh, guide a lot of our treatment, um, these are two guidelines documents that you could Google. Um, they are, I think, probably open access journals that you can take a look at. And so these are the consensus statements um, from imaging societies, both in the United States and in Europe, about how to use different imaging techniques um, to understand uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. There's another statement that's um, available as well from the Heart Rhythm Society on cardiac sarcoidosis that um, provides a lot of, of, of uh, general guidelines to how we take care of patients in, in medically with uh, this disease. So taking a step back, right, cardiac sarcoidosis is um, a systemic disease. It involves, uh, can involve the, the, any part of the body, and it's a granulomatous disease, meaning that it has a specific look when we take samples on a biopsy. We don't know why, why it happens to different people, but we do know that in about uh, 20 or sometimes even higher proportions of patients, that we can find cardiac evidence uh, when we, if we were to take a look at pe people's hearts um, at autopsy or in other ways. Uh, in, in, while many people, people have sarcoidosis, uh, cardiac involvement can cause a significant burden of mortality, meaning that people ha uh, um, can have uh, bad events because they have cardiac involvement. And that can occur because they get uh, arrhythmias, either fast arrhythmias or heart beats too fast or slow arrhythmias. Uh, over time, the heart can stop working as well, or we call contractile dysfunction. The heart can get thicker. In some cases, there have been reports about the heart affecting like, things like the heart arteries and getting some coronary artery disease. One of the reasons why it's difficult to understand who has the disease is because we can't normally get good tissue samples to show that the disease is present. And I'll show you this particular image that illustrates why we can't get good tissue samples. So this is an MRI scan, and this is an MRI scan of the heart. This circle here is the heart. The white stuff here is the blood. This side of the heart is the right side of the heart. This is the left side of the heart that pumps blood. So when we're going to take a biopsy of the heart in, the, in, in a cath lab, which, which is a, not a surgery, it's a procedure that we do through a catheter-based approach, the catheter goes into the, the right side of the heart, and we take a little tiny little snippet of tissue from right here, this area of this, what we call the septum in between the two pumping chambers of the heart. Now this 
white stuff over here is, in, is indicative of sarcoidosis. You can see because we're sampling over here, we're not even in the area where sarcoidosis is involving the heart in this particular patient because sarcoidosis in the heart can be very patchy. So that's why biopsy doesn't work and why we can't get a definitive tissue diagnosis in most of the patients we treat. But we do know that for, for various reasons, the people are getting, tend to be getting more sarcoidosis. And that might be because we're able to detect it more easily because the imaging tools that we are using like CAT scans and PET scans and MRI scans are becoming more used in, in, in broader groups of the population. This is a study that just looked at the number of hospitalizations that are occurring across the United States. Uh, it's showing a slight increase over the time period from 2005 to 2014. And then a lot of these patients had heart problems, whether it's heart failure or arrhythmias or other problems uh, with, the, with the heart. So there's a significant disease burden, as you all know, from cardiac involvement. So let's talk about, do I have cardiac sarcoidosis and how we make that assessment? Well, the first thing we do when we're looking for cardiac sarcoidosis is we look for sarcoidosis in other parts of the body because it's a lot more likely that the, anything we find in the heart is due to sarcoidosis if we find sarcoidosis somewhere else. And we know that sarcoidosis is present in the lungs in about 90% of people, that we can find it in lymph nodes or infiltrates on CAT scans or on chest X-ray. And many of you were probably picked up that way. You went to see a physician or, because you had a cough or you had a chest X-ray for another reason. And oh, by the way, they found you had sarcoidosis. Most people with pulmonary sarcoidosis never have to have treatment and do fine, but in a minority, people end up having pulmonary problems. In addition, people can have skin problems, and, and, and Dr. Young will talk about that, including things like erythema nodosum or lupus pernio on the face or other problems. People can have sarcoidosis involving the eyes. 25% of people can have problems if we, if we biopsy different parts of the eyes, uh, the, 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 the skin around the eyes, for example, to find sarcoid involvement. And people can have problems with some laboratories, such as calcium in the blood or, or, or kidney problems. So we look for whole body sarcoidosis to help us figure out whether there's heart involvement. Now, when we get into the, the, how we diagnose the heart involvement, we're intuiting it from a lot of different variables. A lot, this is one of the criteria that's been proposed to diagnose car, cardiac sarcoidosis. This is what's called the Japanese Ministry of Health and Welfare criteria. There have been a number of these revisions throughout the years. Suffice it to say, they're very complicated criteria and they involve things like, is there heart problems? Are there imaging problems? Uh, and how can we put these, all these together to make an assessment of whether uh, sarcoidosis is present? There are some problems with this though. That there's, there, these weren't experimentally defined and there's some ambiguity in how the imaging is used to, to, to make these assessments. So what we do a lot of times is we take a number of imaging studies of the heart. And here's two examples a cardiac MRI scan, shown here on, in this column, or PET scans, which use radioactive glucose to look for inflammation. And there are various patterns that have different likelihoods of having sarcoid involvement. We rarely say there's absolutely no chance you have sarcoidosis, and we rarely say there's a 100% chance you do have cardiac sarcoidosis. We're usually uh, somewhere in between, like we're saying it's very unlikely, or it's very probable, that you have cardiac sarcoidosis, but in the absence of biopsy, a lot of times we're not 100% sure. So we have to intuit what we, what we, could, what we know from the, from the presentation and provide the patients with an assessment of what we think the likelihood is of them having the disease. And unfortunately, we have some uncertainty that, uh, that, 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 that resides because we don't have that, that tissue in a, in, a lot of in a lot of patients. Here's a nice example though of a case that we presented of why sometimes you need both PET scans and MRI scans. So this is what a woman that presented to our hospital with new heart block, meaning that her heart was, was beating slowly. And this is a PET scan of the heart. These orange dots are evidence of active sarcoidosis inflammation. And this orange dot uh, right here is right in the area of the heart where, where uh, heart block or slow heartbeats would be caused from. And so we were able to make this diagnosis of sarcoidosis, not only from that, but because we did an MRI scan, which is shown here, this is another picture of her heart, and this white stuff is evidence of sarcoid inflammation in, in uh, a particular part, part of the heart. In this case, and in many cases, the PET scan and the MRI scans are complement each other to help us be more confident that, about what we know in an uh, in individual patient. So here's a, a, one of the algorithms that we use in patients who have suspected sarcoidosis. We look for systemic disease, other places. 
We ask first, is there, can the patient get an MRI scan of their heart? Meaning they don't have a pacemaker and they don't have kidney problems, which can, be a, which can limit our ability to, to get accurate images. And we'll get an MRI scan. If that's abnormal, a lot of times we'll talk about whether or not that means patients might benefit from an ICD, if they, if a defibrillator. If they can't get an MRI scan or if there's active, if there's evidence of disease, we might then go to a PET scan. And we'll use the PET scan then to make a determination of, uh, of whether or not steroids or immunosuppression might be useful in a, given, in a given patient. So these MRI scans and PET scans are complementary to each other for our assessment of the likelihood of the disease. Next, I'm moving on to that question about, do I need a defibrillator? Let's talk about a couple of different concepts in defibrillators. The first is primary prevention, meaning you have a, a condition that may predispose one to having uh, life-threatening arrhythmias needing treatment, uh, but we don't know that you've had those arrhythmias in the past. And so that decision for the ICD or the defibrillators based on a risk benefit calculation, such as a person's age, their heart function, the need for a pacemaker or other features. If one has had an arrhythmia, such as a ventricular arrhythmia that's caused somebody to pass out, or if they've had unfortunate sudden death or they've been resuscitated from uh, a, a history of life-threatening arrhythmias, some, it makes the decision a lot easier because we want to prevent that from happening again. It's the primary prevention patients where, we, where we're basing our assessment of the need on a risk assessment that can be more challenging. And we use those imaging tools I've talked about, MRI and PET, to help us figure that out. Here's, a, here's some data from uh, a group at, at, up in Boston that looked at all the MRI scan reports that, were, that, that, had been, that had been published up until 2016. And what they found is that if you had an abnormal MRI, you had a higher risk of having a, a, a problem. If you had a, not an abnormal MRI, a normal MRI, meaning no what we call late gadolinium enhancement, your risk was really, really low. And so a lot of times we'll use those MRIs as risk assessment tools to help us make a decision. We can also look at PET scans, and this is another uh, 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 some other data showing that people who have normal PET scans, meaning they have normal blood flow and no evidence of inflammation or what we call FDG, those patients in this green line, they do very well. But if you have abnormal, uh, if you have evidence of scars or you have evidence of inflammation here in the red, uh, those patients didn't do as well and need to be treated more aggressively. So we use the information to uh, make, those, make some of those determinations about the need for a defibrillator. Lastly, let's talk about the idea of, do I need steroids or medication to, a, to reduce the inflammation from sarcoid? There are big questions in this, and this is not straightforward. This is a very complex decision, make, decision tree that encompasses a lot of variables. The first is we don't exactly know who needs it, who benefits from it. Is it patients who have normal heart function or those who on, only benefit if their heart function is abnormal? How about those patients who present with arrhythmias versus slow heartbeats, fast heartbeats versus slow heartbeats? If we decide to treat them, how should we treat them with what agents? Steroids, if those of you who've been on steroids know that in general, long-term people don't like them. They cause a lot of side effects. Uh, how long should we treat them? Should we treat everybody the same or should we use some imaging tools to make that assessment of, about what, what the treatment, when the treatment should be reduced? And how should we assess the treatment? Is it a, an endpoint where we're saying, or we're going to treat everybody for a certain duration, or we're going to look for some markers of a heart function or a rhythms that, that guide our, 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 our treatment approach. And these answers are not, not known yet. But here's some uh, understanding. This is, this is an uh, example of some treatment response. So this is a PET scan, and this is the patient rotating around here. I'm sorry, this is so blippy. The black dots are, are evidence of sarcoid disease activity. And this is that same patient just, you know, looking down uh, the patient's body. And in this case, those e evidence of sarcoid is labeled uh, purple and orange. And you'll see as we go through this, there's a lot of purple and orange in this picture, right? And so this is in the lungs, this is in the heart, this is in the spleen. We have a lot of disease activity in a PET scan. Let's treat the patient with steroids and see what happens. You know, magically all the black dots go away. When we look at it here in another view, the black, the orange dots are a lot less apparent. So there's an imaging response to treatment with immunosuppression. So our current thought is that some patients in, 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 with certain scenarios, but not everybody with cardiac sarcoidosis, 
could probably benefit from immunosuppression it, it, it's depending on how you define it. And probably the patients that benefit the most are those with some degree, but not a lot of heart dysfunction and some degree, but not a lot of, of inflammation on our PET scans. And this is data to say, show that people who respond, that their PET scan gets better, that their heart function generally gets better. Uh, a reduction of inflammation leads to, leads to an improvement in heart function. Thankfully, we're, we're in, uh, we have ongoing the first ever randomized treatment study for cardiac sarcoidosis. This is called the CHASM randomized clinical trial. We are a site, we're not involved in the, in the uh, running of the trial, but we know the people who are, Dr. David Burney from the University of Ottawa. And this is a multi-centered international treatment trial, the first ever treatment trial of cardiac sarcoidosis. And what we're doing with this study is we're asking a simple question, is prednisone better than prednisone plus methotrexate? Or said another way, can we reduce the amount of prednisone we're giving to people by using a steroid sparing agent? And so we're, this is actively enrolling at multiple sites, including our own around the country, in patients who are treatment naive, uh, meaning they've never had immunosuppression, and they're being randomized to these two treatments. And we're going to look at outcomes and have some evidence behind what we're doing for our treatment of cardiac sarcoidosis in the coming years. So right now, we think that PET imaging re represents the best way of measuring treatment response, but, but in the future, that might change. And here's how we generally approach our treatment. We ask first, is there, is there an abnormality in the PET scan? If, if, if there isn't, then we generally don't treat for, for cardiac disease. Our first choice is usually prednisone with some pre prevention of osteoporosis and, and, and other opportunistic infec infections. And then we repeat the PET scan in, in, a, in a few months, usually somewhere between four and six months, using the same preparation, uh, using the same dose, using the same uh, imaging techniques at the same institution to look to see if that inflammation has been reduced. If it, if it doesn't, or there are clinical changes, then we might add another agent. If it does, then we generally taper our steroids down uh, significantly over the course of the next month or two. So at this point, I'm going to switch it over. I'm going to hand, hand the baton over to our next speaker. But again, thanks to um, FSR and uh, thanks to all the folks at, at Yale and the cardiomyopathy and cardiac sarcoidosis problem, including our pulmonary and electrophysiology pacemaker colleagues, Dr. Young, who works with me, and our, our colleagues in dermatology. Uh, this is my uh, contact information, including a uh, Twitter handle, yeah, et cetera, if people are interested. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Miller. That yeah. was great. Um, folks, I'm going to hand this over next to Sammy Sarani, who is our next um, just, you know, person to talk. Um, also, just so you know, uh, we are taking questions through the chat function on this webinar today. Um, so make sure if you do have questions that go ahead and push that through to all panelists so that we can take a look at that um, and get and add that to the Q&A session. So next, uh, Sammy, if you'd like to go. Oh, you're on mute. Mute guys, right? It just, it gets, it gets me every time too. There it is, got it. Better? All good, you're good. We're all set, very good. Thank you, uh, Mindy, and uh, thanks everyone for being here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Sammy Soriani. I'm a physician assistant. Uh, I've been in um, uh, practice for some 34 years in uh, emergency medicine and, and in cardiology. I wanna to talk to you from more of a personal standpoint because uh, I'm going to talk about my introduction to sarcoidosis and what I have found out since. Uh, I think the first time I was ever exposed to sarcoid was about 34 years ago in PA school. Uh, we were going over pulmonary diseases and, and that was a, 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 there was a brief reference to sarcoidosis as an inflammatory disease characterized by the formation of granulomas in the lungs. And it was usually found as an incidental finding on x-ray, which basically means that you were looking for one thing and you ended up finding something else. And, and that was it. We just kind of like moved on to the next disease after that. Because, you know, back then we really didn't know very much uh, about what was going on. We certainly know more now, but we really still don't know very much. For instance, I didn't know that then that it could affect any organ system. I simply thought it was only a pulmonary disease, but it was something that I would personally learn about years later. Back in 2003, uh, I had a bike accident. I was riding my bike with my kids who were very small then, but 
no longer the case. Uh, and I fell off, uh, caught the handlebars on the right side of my ribs and uh, thought for sure that I, had, that I had broken at least one or two of them. Uh, well, the report comes back and it says, no fractures, patchy infiltrates and likely granulomas suggestive of sarcoidosis. So that for me was my personal incidental moment. And um, I saw a pulmonologist who uh, thankfully at that time biopsied the lymph node to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, I was treated with prednisone for maybe about two months or so. The uh, subsequent CTs showed that I had improvement and uh, that the uh, inflammatory process literally had basically um, gone away. And that's the thing about sarcoidosis is that some people have it and they never know that they have it. Others may have it, they get treated and it goes away. And others have it, they get treated, it goes away and then it comes back. And let's fast forward now 12 years later, 2015, I was probably in the best shape of my life. Uh, I was getting ready to actually to test for my black belt level in karate. And uh, one day I was simply carrying laundry up the stairs and I, I got short of breath. And it was very strange for me. So I, I, out of curiosity, I listened and I had a murmur, which I've never had before. So I went to go see my cardiologist who is a doctor I used to work with. And uh, we did the echocardiogram and he said, yeah, yeah, you have a murmur, but your left ventricle isn't working. I was basically hypokinetic. And uh, the thought right then and there was that I had had a heart attack. So we did the catheterization and all my vessels were open. Everything was, was good. So the question then became, well, what is it? What's causing this problem? Interestingly, sarcoidosis was actually entertained in the differential, but basically it was entertained in a passing way, like there's no way it could possibly be sarcoid. So my wife, who is a journalist, suggested that I see a specialist, and it's always a good idea to listen to your wife. And uh, she had interviewed this doctor uh, several times, and he had written many articles on sarcoidosis. And he said one thing that was very, that stood out to me. And he said that if you have biopsy proven sarcoid someplace in your body and a new issue arises, you should consider to be having sarcoid unless you can prove it otherwise. So I went off, I had a cardiac PET scan and sure enough, sarcoid got my heart. So let me talk a little bit about that PET scan. Uh, it, you know, it's a great test. It allows you to see where the inflammation, uh, the inflammatory activity in your heart is. And those inflammatory cells need a lot of energy to do, to do the damage that they're trying to do. And glucose obviously is a great energy source. The test, however, requires that you follow a very strict high fat diet protocol, which is not necessarily the easiest thing to do. You get radioactive glucose, which is infused, and those cells, which you've starved for a day or so ahead of time uh, of any energy source at all, see the, sees that glucose, and they basically take it all in, and then you're able to see where the inflammation is occurring, and not only in a heart, but any place else in the body where uh, sarcoid might be active. The issue with that test, though, is the PrEP itself. It is not, if it's not done correctly, it can greatly impact to the reliability of the results that you get. And it's simply not an easy thing to do, especially if you're traveling halfway across the country on a train to get to your appointment. Now, I believe that Dr. Young has some insights on this with the work that he's been doing. So I'll be interested to hear what he has to say. Uh, I can tell you that I've been through this prep many times myself. I don't necessarily look forward to it, but I do look forward to the spaghetti dinner that I have afterwards though. Just as an aside, it makes sense that if you are going to do a cardiac PET scan, in my view, that you might as well do include a full body PET scan to see if you have activity going on elsewhere in the body. And many facilities do this, but insurance companies don't necessarily see it that way. Uh, the first time I had this ordered, I was denied, uh, and it was uh, based on the fact that it was deemed to be an unnecessary test. Um, I appealed it and it required at that point a peer-to-peer -peer review, basically meaning that the doctor from the uh, insurance company was going to talk to the doctor who ordered the test and discuss the reasons why behind it. 
And uh, that just happened to be my doctor who I happen to work with. And that day that that call occurred, uh, he wasn't available. So I took the call myself and introduced myself to which the doctor said, that's very interesting because you have the same name as the patient that I want to talk about. So I then told him that it, we were one and the same person and went on to educate him as to the reasons behind the request. And right then and there, I got the approval for the full body PET scan. Uh, that got me thinking that not everyone was in my type of situation where that could occur. And uh, there's so many people that could be at a loss as to what they face, as to what, what to turn to next when they get a denial like that, and what's the next step for them. So that led me to get in touch with the foundation, and I ended up volunteering as a patient navigator, simply because I felt there was a necessity to assist others uh, working through that maze of questions that this disease can bring on. And one last thing too, I wanna to talk quickly, just to make a mention about the importance of the sarcoid centers of excellence. These are facilities that are across the country uh, that meet the standard of care by providing a comprehensive evaluation of the multi-system impact of sarcoid. And they could be found on the FSR website. Uh, and uh, there's a good place to go for folks that uh, don't know anything about sarcoid and don't know where to turn those are great facilities to, to look into. And uh, uh, I know Dr. Miller has talked a, a little bit about what's going on uh, with uh, at the Yale University program. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, back to you, Mindy, and uh, to Dr. Young. Great, thank you so much, Sammy. And for folks, if you're, if you're interested in getting a patient navigator, if you need a patient navigator, those, Sammy's been trained to provide one-on-one -on -one support for those of you who need that for 45 days, you can, um, request a patient navigator on our website. Additionally, you can find um, all of our centers of excellence and all the fine folks at Yale on our website as well. With that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Brian Young. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, can you see my screen? We do. Yeah, great. Well, thank you, Sammy, for sharing your story and thanks to FSR for the invitation again. This is my uh, second town hall, um, and I just really want to thank FSR again for supporting you know the early phase of my career here. I work with Ed Miller. Um, I've been doing this not quite as long as he has just yet, um, about three years into this, um, and FSR has really given me the freedom to participate in a lot of different initiatives across different disciplines here at Yale in our multidisciplinary center that I'll talk about here in just a minute. So. Um, like Dr. Miller, I'm a cardiologist. Um, my focus is also on cardiac imaging. Um, and we have a lot of lines of investigation in our center that really are grouped into three major initiatives. Um, first of all, we've been working for several years on improving the imaging techniques um, that we use uh, that, that Sammy mentioned uh, in the PET scanners um, and in, in the cardiac MRI. And we um, focus a lot on that diet prep, which is not easy and which is very critical um, to getting the details of the scan just right so that we can make an accurate determination of what we're looking at. Um, and we uh, have really worked on the technical aspects of this for a long time. And a lot of it doesn't necessarily make for really great town hall talk and its details, but the important thing is that we're improving the scan protocol. And I'll kind of circle back to that a little bit at the end when I show some of the pictures. Um, in the limited time I have tonight, I wanna to focus on two other major areas in progress. Um, and one is that we've reached a major milestone in a multi-year project that aims to give physicians new ways to monitor sarcoidosis outside of our imaging laboratory. And we call those biomarkers. And they're simply substances in the blood, typically certain proteins that we can detect in lab tests that might be able to tell us what's going on with a particular disease. Um, they can tell us whether that disease is present or not. They can tell us whether the disease is active or not um, in theory, or they can tell us whether it's getting better or getting worse. And so the goal is to add a healthcare, uh, a, a tool in a healthcare provider's toolkit that might either augment the information that we get from the scans or reduce the frequency with which we have to get those PET scans. Because you saw in one of the slides earlier that 
oftentimes a change in treatment results in another four to six month scan, results in a change in treatment and results in another scan. So in our own laboratory, we see patients come, coming back um, not to make the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis. These are patients who are coming to us because they have the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis and they need help with management decisions. And we need a test to guide these decisions because they're big decisions. An immunosuppressant is not trivial. Having untreated cardiac sarcoidosis is, is, is terrible. So um, we're really balancing these things with this very sophisticated and often cumbersome test, um, either the PET or the MRI. So um, the last thing I will uh, have time to talk about, I think, is that we get to share some early results of a new and exciting clinical trial that is ongoing, but is nearing completion of its first monitoring period. So um, we'll get to show you a little yet unpublished information about what we found so far. Um, so this will all kind of fit together something like this. Um, this is a model of how treatment often works, and we've kind of alluded to this twice now, and that's that cardiac sarcoidosis really presents this unique challenge. We, um, it has the potential to progress silently um, without symptoms until one day you're carrying laundry up the stairs, right? And um, suddenly you have serious adverse cardiac events that weren't preceded by any real clinical sign. Um, sometimes it takes you know, that bike accident to know you have sarcoidosis at all. But once you have it, knowing what you're treating and being able to accurately assess the status of the disease is really critical to knowing what to do on the therapy end. So there's always this critical monitoring going on with your doctor, EKGs, echocardiograms, but often when there's a big decision to be made over here in the therapy, it comes down to a cardiac PET scan. Um, and that's what we do. So these are, these are big deals. You know, it's, it's a loss of a morning. It's, it's an IV, it's a tracer, it's, it's a few hours waiting. It's two, scan, two, two trips through the scanner. It's, it's the day of diet where you eat nothing but fat and no carbs and hope that the diet was good enough that the scan works as intended. Um, so it's a good test, but it's not uncommon for our patients to need repeat scans months apart. And it's not unheard of for these scans to not show us what we necessarily need to know on the first pass. So if the inflammation is looking worse on the scan, that we usually would lead to an increase in therapy, an addition of something like methotrexate, an increase in a prednisone dose. Um, and if things are looking good, that might mean that therapy is adjusted down or that you just stay the course of what you are. Uh, what you're doing. So where would a new test come in exactly? Um, there, there's long been hope in the field that we could find biomarkers, which are blood tests, um, that just like you could detect a heart attack uh, with a cardiac enzyme, or you could detect prostate cancer with a PSA, that you could sort people out into groups where a group, one person who has sarcoidosis would have some different result on a blood test than a person who doesn't have sarcoidosis at all. Um, just as we sort out people with other medical conditions. But when you get into that loop, when you have the diagnosis and you're trying to decide whether or not to alter therapy, what we realized is that we needed something different. We needed a biomarker that give us a clue, not about the diagnosis in general, not if there was cardio, cardiac sarcoidosis or whether there was sarcoidosis somewhere in the body. We needed to know whether there was the presence or, active, uh, presence or absence of active disease something that we needed to treat, something that we needed to up titrate a therapy for. So how do you do that? You can't just recruit volunteers in the usual way and say, everybody in my clinic who has sarcoidosis, I'm gonna ask them to give me blood and I'll compare that to, to patients without sarcoidosis and we'll see what's different. In this case, what we needed is we needed to get blood at the time of our cardiac sarcoidosis patients having active disease. So when do we know for sure that our patients have active disease? it's when they get a PET scan and we see that active disease on the PET scan. So our approach was to take people not in clinic, but who are coming into our imaging center and ask them to give us blood. Um, and so we took the blood at the time of the PET scan, the day they arrived for having these scans in patients who know, were known to have the diagnosis. And that let us sort everyone into active disease, no active disease, but a diagnosis active disease in the lungs, active disease in the heart, active disease in both, active disease nowhere. Um, and we can sort these out and we sent these to one of our collaborators that is an expert in testing samples for a huge array of possible biomarkers. 
So instead of just having one or two um, hypo hypothetical biomarkers, we sent and collected results for hundreds of molecules um, and cranked it through the, uh, the machine of this really well-run laboratory with our collaborator and collected the results. And with a little math and a few more experiments, um, we're hoping to put these results into, into panels of blood tests or in at least one, but more likely an array of blood tests that could tell us when a patient's sarcoidosis is acting up. Not that they would replace all the scans altogether, but hopefully that they might give us a clue and a chance to say, um, you know, maybe we can hold off on another pet for a while. Maybe we can delay your next pet to see if the new prednisone does work, or maybe we need to get the pet sooner. Um, so what would this look like in, in, in this process? Well, if we take these people that had active disease and we get their blood and inactive disease and we get their blood, and we have this panel that we can use to correlate to people who have active disease, then with your doctor, instead of just going through this process and this loop, iterative loop where you use the imaging, we imagine that you might be able to augment this with these blood tests and your doctor could say, you know, let's wait or let's get the scan early, let's get the scan later, let's make a change and then get the scan. And in that way, we could reduce the number of times you have to go through this scan, um, you know, waiting on your, your post-scan spaghetti, you know, going through the terrible diet and, and going through the difficulty of this. Um, in order to titrate therapy more quickly and more efficiently. The other outcome of this study is that we found things that we weren't exactly expecting to find. Um, you know, we kind of have an idea of what we might find in your blood if cardiac sarcoidosis is active. We might find cardiac enzymes, um, muscle proteins that spill out of the heart into the blood have been looked at in the past as a possibility of, of, of a thing that we might use as a clue that the heart is getting damaged, but that's not very specific to the disease cardiac sarcoidosis. We see those enzymes in people who have coronary disease as well, which is vastly more common. Um, so what we're looking for is something unique. And what we found were other enzymes that I don't have time to talk about in detail tonight, but they're remodeling enzymes that fix the space between our cells um, when things are damaging our tissues. Um, we found growth factors that are active um, and that spill into the bloodstream when the body's trying to rebuild blood vessels that have been damaged by granulomas, or if the granulomas are sending out signaling molecules of their own. Um, we found a broad array of new molecules. And as a person trained in molecular biology, these are clues as to what I might need to look into next as we think about the basic biology of what's happening in sarcoidosis. So um, that's our approach to hopefully uh, reducing the burden of these PET scans that Sammy talked about. Um, even though we want to make them better and we know we'll continue to use them, we want to augment them and make the clinical experience of the sarcoidosis patient better. Finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about new treatments. A few years ago, um, just a few years ago, a really great dermatologist and now friend of ours at Yale um, named Bill Damsky uh, told us at a multidisciplinary meeting, a research meeting that we have at Yale, about this new clinical trial he was just getting started for his patients who had sarcoidosis of their skin and who hadn't responded well to any of the conventional therapies, prednisone and methotrexate and others. And so he was doing a trial with a drug called topacitinib. Its brand name is Zeljans. It's a drug by Pfizer. You've probably seen it on television because it's already used for other inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and ulcerative colitis. And so he was seeking a way to monitor whether or not people responding to this in an objective way, objective way other than just looking at their skin. He wanted to quantify it and say, this person is responding this well, because after all, we do have other drugs that sort of work a little for these conditions. We want to prove that this might work better. Um, so we adapted our cardiac imaging methods to a whole body protocol, um, which we hadn't previously been doing um, at Yale. Um, and we use this to scan the participants before starting this new treatment for their skin and after six, months of uh, after six months of therapy. And the nice thing about a PET scan is not only do we get that picture of the skin that Dr. Damsky was looking for the purpose of the study, but we get lungs and heart and everything in between. Um, and so we're nearing the end of this study. And I want to just kind of highlight kind of the village it takes to do something of this scope. Um, this study was led um, primarily by dermatology, and that's these, uh, this huge crew at the top. In cardiology, um, 
myself, um, Dr. Miller, um, a radiologist who helps us uh, interpret the scans, as well as one of our um, most experienced technicians who helped us develop the whole body protocol. Um, we also have involved our lung doctors, experts in um, pulmonary sarcoidosis. Uh, Wani Ryu was actually one of the FSR fellows along with me just a few years ago, and he's in his early career and got a great start from FSR as well. And of course, you've got to throw in, you know, one of the most famous immunologists alive and Howard Hughes investigator, Richard Fovell, just to kind of round out the team. And this is the kind of stuff that we saw on this. And I want to point out what you're looking at because there are places that FDG goes that are normal. In particular, your body gets rid of the tracer that we use to image by, um, by the kidneys. And so you see in the kidneys, the, the uh, tracer goes there, the FDG goes there, and it goes down the ureter and the kidneys into the bladder. And so that's normal. That's, that's not a big tumor. That's a bladder full of FDG tracer. Um, but what you also see here in this patient is you see these spots in the lungs, and this is not normal. Um, and you also see here is the reason they were in this trial is that they had horrible sarcoidosis of the skin that had been refractory to every other treatment they had tried. And after just six months on this therapy, not only did this patient see a complete resolution of their skin disease, but we also saw a resolution of their lung disease that they didn't even know they had before they started the trial. This is uh, two different patients, one on the top, a pulmonary patient, much like the scan you saw earlier in Dr. Miller's presentation, a lot of disease in these nodes in the lungs, um, out in the lung tissue. Um, these are the ribs, just to orient you to these CT scans, this is the spine. So you're looking kind of at a slice, looking down the patient, the heart and the associated blood vessels are in the middle. This is the sternum, so this is the patient's back, the patient's shoulder blades. So this is the lung and these are not supposed to be there. Um, this is a cardiac patient. This is normal. This is actually a little bit of signal in the liver. We always see that. We can't make the liver completely stop taking up FDG. We'll talk about that diet at the very end. But this is a spot on the heart, just like the spot on the heart of that patient who had heart block um, that you saw in Dr. Miller's presentation. And that spot can be dangerous. It can cause abnormal heart rhythms. It can cause heart failure. Again, these are patients, keep in mind, who entered this trial because they had skin disease. And in both cases, we saw a resolution um, improvement of not only their skin disease, but we saw their lung disease go away in six months of therapy. We saw cardiac disease go away in just six months of therapy on these drugs. Some of these patients were able to reduce their prednisone dose while they were on the Zelchans, um, the tofacitinib, and others uh, continued their prednisone dose and saw improvements in their sarcoidosis that they had not seen previously on prednisone and other conventional drugs like methotrexate. This is some of the looks, uh, some of the views of what it looks like to have these total body scans. And there's a couple really critical findings I wanted to point out here. And this is gonna really take us full circle here. Um, this is what Dr. Pukar has helped us with in putting together the quantitation of how we actually put numbers to how well these patients are doing so that we can um, really present this in a, in a quantitative way in publication. This patient had a lot of involvement of the lung um, had some involvement in the lower extremities that's not pictured here on the skin. And what you see is several things here, some of them subtle, some of them not. One of them is that this disease in the lung almost completely resolved. And here's the numbers to correlate with that. Um, the other thing you see is that this gentleman here, not only did he have good resolution of the disease in his lungs, but he was able to reduce his prednisone dose. He was able to go off methotrexate he started feeling better, he started exercising better. And the other thing, if you have a really good eye, you've noticed that's happened in the six months since he changed all these drugs and started feeling better and exercising, is he's lost a lot of weight. He actually looked like a different person when he showed up for his six month scan. Um, this person over here, again, huge improvement in the lung disease after just six months, we see nothing left in the lungs. And there's one really important finding that's gonna really take us home here. And that's that this patient and the second time he came back for his scan, his heart completely lit up with FDG. This is not sarcoidosis. This is um, what happens when the diet prep is not done well enough um, for us to get the cardiac information. And what happened here is that the heart continued using glucose as our hearts always do unless we force them to do otherwise. And so instead of using fats, um, like we force the heart to do with the diet prep, um, for some reason that we're not quite clear on, something he ate um, provided carbohydrates to his heart so that his heart continued using glucose 
took up FDG. And so you imagine that if, if we needed to know whether his heart had sarcoidosis in it, we wouldn't be able to see it against this backdrop of really, really bright signal in the heart. And so this is in one picture, the importance of that difficult diet that Sammy talked about earlier. Um, so we're collecting all this data. We have a few more patients to get final scans as we get to our endpoints and put it all together but to show that um, one, we have a protocol where we can do whole body scanning and that that whole body scanning is worthwhile because we find things in patients who come for a skin problem and realize they have a lung problem or a heart problem as well. Um, we can use these scans to quantify how well they do. And we have a new drug to add to the toolbox of many other anti-inflammatory drugs that might make people feel better and live, uh, live a better life um, with sarcoidosis. So once again, thanks to FSR for inviting us. Um, I understand we have some questions already coming in in the comments. And I'll let Mindy take it over from there. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Young. Um, so we do have some questions and um, please folks, if you do, have, if you have a question, uh, go ahead and pop that in the chat to all the panelists so we can see that. Um, of course, some of you, uh, thankfully, uh, we have questions uh, lined up from registration. And so the first question we have is actually around understanding if there's a genetic connection to cardiac sarcoidosis, but also just sarcoidosis in general. Yeah, so uh, good question. Uh, get to ask this a lot. There's, um, there's uh, certainly uh, predisposition in families to sarcoidosis, and there have been some, um, some variants of different genes that regulate inflammation in particular to, that, uh, um, that can be uh, associated with the susceptibility, but there's no single gene that we know of that causes sarcoidosis. Thank you. Um, we do have another question uh, around the new drug that Dr. Young mentioned. Um, can you give us the name of that drug again, please? Oh, you already did in the notes. <laughs> well, you're on mute. Just to be just to be clear, this is not FDA approved for for sarcoidosis, um, as as are very few drugs. But uh, um, so uh, it's not going to be. It, it would be challenging, I think, to go to your a local sarcoidosis expert to, mm -hmm. to get that uh, pres prescribed, although it is uh, possibly available uh, uh, through different mechanisms. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. So those are folks, um, that name of that drug is in the, in the chat, but as Dr. Miller reminds us, it is not approved. Um, one of our other questions, we actually got this question several times from people who registered. They had a question around how often is it the case that uh, cardiac sarcoidosis would lead to the need for a heart transplant. We do have a couple of folks who mentioned that they did, they have a heart transplant. Mm, yeah. Um, so in our experience, it's rare, you know, it happens. Um, it, the natural, one of the kind of things that we don't really understand is the natural history of the disease, right? Is it, is, is it a progressive, slow, progressive decline? Or my general formulation is that it goes in fits and starts, right? It, you have periods of stability and then uh, periods of disease activity. Uh, the number of patients that go on for heart transplantation for sarcoidosis are low, but they're not zero. We've, we've, we've done several cases of uh, transplant for sarcoidosis. It tends to be obviously patients that have had a long period of time of cardiac involvement and their, and their heart function has been uh, reduced significantly over, over time with eventual scarring. Thank you. Um, we did have another question about the Zeljans. Um, uh, is that the kind of drug that people would expect? I mean, do you maybe have this information around um, whether it's expected that they would just stay on it forever? The patients who saw relief from it. Yeah, well, we don't know yet. Um, part of the project here um, and is following them continuously. Um, so we've seen all these patients at the six month mark. We've seen them at the 12 month mark. And like any immunosuppressive drug, um, you know, the, the side effects are, are, are a risk of infection. Um, so you don't want to be on any immunosuppressant, whether it's prednisone or this drug, longer than you have to be. So I think like the others, it, it will kind of find a place among the others, hopefully eventually, again, not approved yet. 
Um, but hopefully it'll find a place as something that some people respond to better than other drugs, um, but hopefully not a, a permanent, permanent drug um, in that sense. It, I hope that answers the question. Um, Thank you. I think I think so. It, guys, if that didn't answer the question, just go ahead and pop that in. Um, we also have a question that was in the registration around, do we have any understanding, and this question actually comes up to FSR quite a lot, do we have an understanding around um, uh, environmental causes of sarcoidosis? And I think we touched on it just a little bit earlier about the known reasons for sarcoidosis. But, um, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the classic cases of a beryllium, beryllosis, uh, which was uh, a heavy metal used in shipbuilding, predominantly in electrical manufacturing. So we talked about that. That's really rare nowadays. Uh, um, you know, the, there's been a su suggestion that fungal disease uh, can predispose to pulmonary sarcoidosis. We think there is an environmental trigger. There have been clusters of sarcoidosis uh, after 9-11, 9-11 uh, patients. Um, we don't have a specific marker. It's not like we can say, you know, you, you have a test for radon or a test for lead or a test for, uh, uh, for you know, mold in the house that's going to say you have sarcoidosis because X, Y, or Z. Um, and so we, we don't have good, except for those very, very small minority patients that have beryliosis. And probably it's because sarcoid is not just a single disease. It's a, it's a reaction to a, to a number of triggers uh, in the environment. Thank you. Um, another question we have um, is what kinds of signs should folks watch for if they're, if they have cardiac sarcoidosis, um, what kinds of things might suggest things are getting worse? A, a change in your exercise capacity. Um, I think the uh, Sammy's experience would be a, a good example of that. Um, healthiest time in your life and suddenly you can't do stairs that you could do just a short time ago would be an indication that your heart is not working well. Um, sometimes these cause abnormal heart rhythms. So the feeling that you're lightheaded or dizzy or going to pass out, flutters in your chest, these can all be um, signs that the sarcoidosis is affecting your heart. Um, but unfortunately, none of these are specific to sarcoidosis. A lot of heart problems present in the same way. So um, it's important to remember that Common things are also common, um, and then it's not always the sarcoidosis. But those are, those would be the type of symptoms: change in exercise capacity, um, and things in your chest like palpitations, shortness of breath, chest pain. Great, thank you. Um, and so, just also in the in sort of the spirit of monitoring, folks, you know, FSR does have a patient reported registry that, you know, researchers just like Dr. Young and Dr. Miller might. Um, need access to uh, that does track people's, you know, status over time. You report into that every uh, year and that can help us understand the sort of things that are going on as well with the researchers. So uh, thank you for that. Um, we have another question uh, around sort of where do the granulomas sort of manifest um, in the heart itself? Is it in the muscle? Is it around them? Um, we actually got this question, two, two of these questions in registration. So inquiring minds want to know. Yeah, uh, so uh, there tend to be some certain patterns of granulomas inflammation, but they can be anywhere in the heart. Uh, it tends to uh, affect what we call the right bundle of, of the conduction system of the heart for reasons we don't understand. Uh, uh, it affects part of the heart where the, where the electrical signals go from one chamber to the other called the AV node. Those cause, can cause uh, um, is, is, uh, sort of classic features, uh, but it can, it can also be um, any, any particular portion of the heart, but in the muscle predominantly, predominantly. Thank you. Um, and then we're, we're almost close on time, guys. So I will um, add one more question here and um, I have two more questions. So the first one is, what are the benefits of patients getting care at a uh, an FSR Wausau Center of Excellence? Yeah, so I think this. Um, so I think there are a couple of things. One is sarcoid is not a single organ disease, so you know people need to be followed by multiple uh, specialty teams. Um, 
usually that involves a most often that involves a cardi uh, pulmonologist and or a rheumatologist to direct their systemic care pulmonologist for routine pulmonary monitoring to make sure the lung function is staying stable. And then depending on what other organs are involved, um, you know, the, you, you, the organs tend to be skin, heart, liver, uh, are the major organ defining and, and, and central nervous system. So um, coordinating those care, coordinating the immunosuppression, having expertise in uh, the imaging of the disease um, are all important and then access to clinical trials. Those are kind of the main uh, benefits. Thank you. Uh, and then the fa sort of follow-up question to that one is, um, if folks are not within, you know, easy driving distance of a center of excellence, are there suggestions for the ways in which they might engage centers of excellence? Or, um, I mean, certainly FSR has a physician finder folks. So yep. if you are looking for a physician who is versed in sarcoidosis, we're able to connect you there. Um, but particularly people had a question around, um, if they can't get to a center of excellence, can a center of excellence still see them? I guess is their question. Well, one of the you know the only one of the only benefits of COVID, right, is that we have all these video visits now. So, uh, video televisits, telehealth visits are are now commonplace, uh, and we do them. Um, you know, I know that you know in addition to our center, Mayo Clinic offers a very robust telehealth visit program. I don't know if there's an if they're an FSR center, but there's certainly a center of excellence. Cleveland Clinic, same way, and I know they are a center of excellence. They offer uh, record review by, uh, by experts in the field. Um, um, uh, so, you know, you, you, you can easily uh, send records uh, to those centers, set up a telehealth visit, but be prepared to then be able to go to the place where you had your primary imaging done and get the actual imaging discs and send those to the, to the physicians you're gonna to wanna to have review them so they can look at the actual images. But that's, you know, it, it shouldn't be a distance. If you're able to log onto this, we can certainly do a, a telehealth visit to uh, review and, and provide recommendations. I like, to, I like to make a mention too, that along those lines, it, it, there are uh, sarcoidosis clinics at various facilities around the country. They might not be as robust as one uh, that you'll see at a uh, center of excellence. But at least there, they can also uh, handle your case. And if they need to move you on to uh, a center of excellence for more interpretation of your condition. Thank you. Um, and so our final question is really around, um, should a PET scan override an MRI? Uh, yeah, uh, no, uh, long, short, long story being short is no, they're, they're, they have to be in, in, interpreted together and they, they really need to be interpreted by expert centers. We've seen, you know, uh, a lot of studies that have been done really well. We've some, seen a lot of studies that have been done not so well. Um, and we've seen patients um, both undertreated and overtreated in our opinion. Um, so um, they provide complementary information um, that, um, that can be useful in both ways. Thank you. And since we have one minute left, I will ask the question that we get multiple times and that is around, um, uh, are there any indications that the COVID vaccine is not good for people with sarcoidosis, uh, specifically cardiac sarcoidosis? Dr. Young? You no, know, we actually were more concerned with our um, with our sarcoidosis patients getting COVID. Honestly, uh, people with pre-existing pulmonary conditions have not done well um, with with this virus. So it would actually be much safer with a conversation with your doctor. It would actually be much better that you do um, get vaccinated because uh, this, as you've heard in the news, this virus really affects people who have predispositions to do not doing well and. One of those is having a disease that affects your heart and lungs. Um, so we do recommend the, the vaccination for our patients. Excellent, thank you. I saved that one for last because it gets listed a lot. Um, thank you, Dr. Young, Dr. Miller, uh, Sammy. This has been fantastic. I hope all of you who were 
here in attendance enjoyed this. Again, we have recorded it. We will be sending out slides in PDF format and the link to this video, as well as a link to our survey. Um, so thank you all very much. And we hope you have an amazing rest of your week and weekend. Thanks. Nice to, nice to talk to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.